Hello and good afternoon. My name is Zulima Chavez and I'm the Support Center Manager for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America or AFA. This episode is produced independently by AFA. Today we're talking about allergies and AFA's Allergy Capitals Report with Jenna Raymond Schneider, AFA's Vice President of Advocacy and Policy, and Hannah Jaffe, Director of Research. Jenna and Hannah, welcome and thank you for joining us on today's episode. Of course. Thanks for having us. In the United States, more than 100 million people live with different types of allergies each year. Many of them have seasonal pollen allergies. Every year, AFA releases an Allergy Capitals report. This year's report is made possible in part by Opella, the makers of Allegra. Allergy Capitals analyzes data from across the United States and ranks the 100 largest cities where it is challenging to live with allergies. Hannah, tell us more about this report and the goal of it. Yeah, happy to share more about the report. So the goal of AFA's Allergy Capitals report is to provide insight on the different factors impacting seasonal allergies. So the report ranks the 100 most populous cities in the contiguous United States by three different factors. The first is tree, grass, and weed pollen scores. Then we also look at over-the-counter allergy medicine use. And finally, the availability of board-certified allergist immunologists. So each city gets a score for each of these factors. And then we crunch the numbers, compile it all into the final ranking, and use the report to raise awareness about seasonal allergies across the United States. And Hannah, if people want more information and would like to read this report, where can they find it? Yes, uh, so you can find the report and download it at allergycapitals.com. Awesome, make sure to check that out. And tell us, Hannah, what were some of this year's key findings and which cities were the top three allergy capitals for 2025? Yeah, so this year we saw a few surprises along with some continuing trends from previous years. So Wichita claims the top spot in our report for the third year in a row. Its placement at number one is the result of the city receiving a worse than average score for all three factors that we look at in the report. Number two is New Orleans, and it actually jumped up from number 34 last year. And this is largely due to a significantly higher weed pollen score this year. We know that this November was the warmest on record in Louisiana, which extended the weed pollen season that was also boosted by the moisture from Hurricane Francine. And then lastly, completing the top three is Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City has landed in the top 10 allergy capitals in every report since 2013. So we have seen it in similar placements before, but nevertheless, its spot at number three this year highlights the burden of allergy in the area. And then another thing beyond the top three that I'd like to mention is that even though the top allergy capitals are concentrated in the southern and eastern regions of the country, we saw some really big changes happening in the West, particularly in California, they experienced increased grass and weed pollen counts in 2024 compared to 2023 due to increased storms, which bring increased moisture. So for this reason, we saw several cities in California drastically jump up in the list in the allergy capitals rankings this year. Thank you for sharing that, Hannah. That's really helpful to know this information and just be aware of different changes that we're seeing across the nation. Earlier, you mentioned pollen, and a pollen count is how much pollen is in the air. It can help people know which type of pollen is in their area and help them manage their seasonal allergies. Tell us more about this and where people can find pollen counts. Yeah, so for our Allergy Capitals report, we look specifically at pollen counts. Pollen counts are taken from samples of pollen at different monitoring sites using pollen counters or sensors and they're based on actual data. On the other hand, you might come across pollen forecasts, which are predictions of expected pollen counts based on historical data. While these pollen forecasts can be helpful, we recommend using pollen counts as a tool to help reduce your exposure to pollen. So you can find pollen counts on local weather outlets or by using a pollen tracking app. So for example, the pollen data that AFA uses for our Allergy Capitals report 
comes from pollen scents, and they use automated pollen sensors to capture and collect pollen data. They have an app uh, that you can use called Pollen Wise that you can download for free, and you can use the Pollen Wise app or other pollen tracking tools to help plan activities around pollen levels. For example, you should plan to do outdoor activities during times when pollen counts are low and plan to stay indoors during times when pollen counts are higher. You should also keep the windows closed during times of high pollen counts. And really using these tools thoughtfully can really help you reduce your exposure to pollen that may trigger your allergy symptoms. Those are great tips. Thank you for sharing. And in addition to tracking the pollen counts that you mentioned, what are some additional steps that people can take to manage their allergies? Yeah, so the good news is that there are a lot of easy, practical steps that you can take every day to help manage your allergies. One recommendation that we have is to reduce your exposure to pollen inside of your home. We recommend using an asthma and allergy friendly certified air cleaner or HVAC filters. You can also remove your shoes when you enter your home, wash your hands after you've been outside, and shower at night to remove the pollen before you go to bed. And then beyond these day-to-day -day tips, there are also a number of over-the-counter and prescription treatments for ma managing allergy symptoms. So when thinking about treatment options, you should really consider your specific needs. Um, for example, whether you need non-drowsy options. So for example, think about, will you be taking the medicine while working or driving? You can talk with your doctor or pharmacist about the best options for your situations and symptoms. One thing that we'd like to point out is AFA does not recommend the use of older generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine to treat allergies because of their risk of side effects. And then lastly, if you have allergy symptoms that don't necessarily respond to over-the-counter treatment, you may want to explore immunotherapy like allergy shots or sublingual treatment. You'll want to talk with your allergist to determine if this option makes sense for you. Yeah, and for our listeners, if you have more questions or just need a little more support with managing your allergies, definitely take some time to reach out to your primary care provider or your allergist to talk about some of the the things that uh, Hannah mentioned today, some of the treatment options that she mentioned. A common question that we get is, if I live in a top allergy capital and have pollen allergies, does that mean I should move? No, definitely not. <laughs> um, so really the allergy capitals report is not intended to be a recommendation of places to move to or places to move from. While we do report for uh, data that impacts allergies, everyone's experience is unique. So you could live in the lowest city on the list, number 100, and still have significant allergies. And we hear this anecdotally, um, even if you move away from your current location and the pollen that you experience there, you could develop new allergies to the pollens in the new location where you live. And pollen is also everywhere. Um, it's very light and it can be carried hundreds of miles with the wind. Um, in the case of ragweed, we also know that it's moving over time too, further and further north. So there's really no one place that's completely free from pollen. And then lastly, it's important to remember that in addition to pollen, the report also looks at medicine usage and access to allergists. So your city may rank higher on the list for any one of these reasons. So really the best plan of action is to follow AFA's tips to manage and control your symptoms. Yeah, thank you for sharing those earlier. And again, in addition to the different treatment plans that you mentioned or the treatment options, an allergist and pharmacist would be a great resource to chat more about and just prepare for the upcoming different pollen seasons and knowing which specific pollens you're allergic to. So you could just keep track of it when those specific seasons come. I wanna take a moment to pivot to climate change. Climate change is leading to longer and more intense allergy seasons, as many have noticed, as well as an increase in asthma triggers. Jenna, what does this look like and what are changes and impacts that we are seeing? Well, the longer and more intense allergy seasons really mean more days with allergy symptoms each year. This can mean missed school days, missed work days, and can significantly impact your quality of life. 
Allergies can also trigger asthma. Uh, in fact, allergic asthma is the most common type of asthma. This means that longer allergy seasons increase the likelihood of asthma attacks. Asthma episodes can then lead to emergency department visits or hospital visits, um, in addition to those missed work and school days that I already mentioned. Climate and health is a key priority for AFA. Climate change is a public health emergency. Jenna, can you tell us more about some of AFA's key work in climate change and how people can join these efforts? Absolutely. Well, you said it. Climate change is a public health emergency, and for people with asthma and allergies, the stakes could not be higher. Rising temperatures, worsening air pollution, and those increased allergens all contribute to more frequent and severe asthma attacks. That's why AFA is committed to strong environmental policies that reduce harmful emissions and protect air quality. We support efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions, transition to zero emission transportation, and enforce air pollution standards that safeguard health, especially in overburdened communities. AFA has been a strong advocate for cleaner cars and trucks, supporting the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA's, greenhouse gas standards for light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles to reduce transportation pollution. And we do this because the transportation sector is currently the largest source of climate change contributing greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. So impacting transportation pollution um, you know, can have a significant impact on climate change. Additionally, we've pushed for stronger national ambient air quality standards for ozone and particulate matter, which are directly linked to respiratory health. We've called on EPA to uphold and enforce these protections rather than rolling them back at the expense of public health. And climate change is directly linked to increased levels of ozone and particle pollution that do contribute to asthma attacks. Now, under the new administration, the Environmental Protection Agency recently announced that many of these critical protections, including the cleaner vehicle standards, mercury and air toxics protections, and limits on that dangerous particle pollution, are going to be rolled back. This puts people's health at risk. We need policymakers to prioritize health and understand the health impacts of climate change on all people but especially on people with asthma and allergies. You can support AFA's efforts by joining our community at AFA.org. Um, and by joining the community, you can help us support these clean air policies. You can help us engage with policymakers. And ultimately, we want to raise the voices of those impacted by air pollution and climate change to really advocate for the change and protection needed. And I'll also add, when we think of climate change, it may seem like a big national scale issue, but what are some additional things that we can do for local change that can address climate change? So for example, what can we do in our communities to address climate change? And what about state lawmakers? That's a great question. Um, while climate change definitely is a global and national issue, Local action plays a critical role in both reducing emissions and protecting people from worsening air quality and allergens. Community and state lawmakers have a unique opportunity to create meaningful change that directly improves public health, especially for those with asthma and allergies. So for example, adding green spaces to urban communities protecting forested lands and diversifying trees in parks can help regulate surface temperatures and reduce the amount of pollen in nearby areas. Electrifying transportation is another opportunity that has immediate local impacts. Promoting electric vehicles not only reduces the carbon emissions that trap greenhouse gases and create urban heat islands, which make pollen more intense, but it also improves air quality particularly in communities near highways or industrial areas where tailpipe pollution is very high. Another key piece is improving access to allergy and asthma care. Some cities and states have shortages of allergists, making it harder for people to get specialized care. Recruiting more specialists and expanding telemedicine services can help ensure that people, especially in rural areas, can get the care that they need. 
state lawmakers have a huge role to play by investing in clean energy, passing stronger air quality laws, and ensuring communities have access to the healthcare resources they need to manage climate-related health impacts. And these steps don't just help the environment. They directly improve life for people with asthma and allergies. Thank you for sharing why it's important for people to understand climate change and the different impacts that it's having on our communities, as well as just practical things that our listeners can do in the different areas of need where they can get involved. What can communities do to improve the quality of life for people with pollen allergies? And can a community action move a city out of the top 10 in the allergy capitals, for example? Hannah, we'll start with you. Yes, so the rankings do tend to shift year over year, and communities can take steps to help mitigate the exposure of pollen over time. So while pollen is airborne and can move hundreds of miles, communities can help reduce the intensity of pollen in their area. Jenna just highlighted some great local strategies to address climate change, like creating green spaces to address urban heat islands that can really make a difference in improving community health. Yeah, and I'm going to double down on the my call to improve access to specialists. Uh, this is something that communities can definitely take action on, and it's so important to invest in the recruitment of allergists, taking a proactive approach in ensuring your community has access to the care that they need. Communities can also provide resources and education on pollen counts, Symptom management includes awareness of triggers, so when communities promote awareness, they can improve quality of life. And there are some communities that don't actually have pollen counting set up. Uh, this is a critical public health investment. Pollen counts are either done by hand, by allergists, or by automated sensors like the ones Hannah mentioned that can be set up in the community. You can put them in places like libraries, hospitals, or schools. So I think bottom line, um, there's a lot of proactive, intentional work that can be done by communities to help reduce exposure and provide the broadest array of treatment options that can overall help move a city out of the top five or 10 allergy capitals. Yeah, you've definitely given me and our listeners a lot to think about and a lot of different calls to action and just practical things that we can do and be thinking about in our community. Hannah and Jenna, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss allergies and the Allergy Capitals Report. It has been a pleasure having you on today's episode. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed listening to the Afternoon Chats podcast available on Spotify and YouTube. Don't miss our future episodes and remember to like and subscribe to our channels. The information presented in our podcast is educational and not intended to provide individual medical advice. Please talk with your healthcare provider for advice about your personal health. If you have questions about asthma, allergies, or just need someone to talk to, our Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America online community is always open. You can find it at aaflikefrankaorg slash join. Have a good afternoon, everyone.